so Stephen Dyke's Bauer, the architect for the work, very wisely halved the number and doubled the size of the architects. So that those of you who know who are now who know Florence, what the instance for the great church of Bologna, will recognize rather similar proportions. Uh, it doesn't look quite like the Gothic church, but you uh, you have to have much larger space to be used for these items. So then uh, there are these pillars and uh, arches, and everything you see now is pure Dyke's Bower, a sort of interesting combination of Norman motifs and Gothic motifs reflecting what the, uh, what the church was. At the uh, eastern part, the tower arches had already been rebuilt about two years before I became vicar, because although they had no idea what to do, they did if they didn't do the stonework of the tower arches, the whole tower would come down, and that would add another, in those days, half a million, in these days, ten million, to the cost of the stonework thing. So those, uh, those uh, ones were be done. Getting back then to what happened from 1957 onwards, <coughs> the, uh, this part, as I say, was made to look better by carving the number of arches. The eastern part was made to look better by doubling the number of arches, as I'll show you in a moment. But just to finish the story, the nave of the font, there was absolutely no trace left whatever. There was no trace left whatever of the floor. And that's a good thing because the whole thing we had a concrete floor and then wonderful underfloor heating, uh, but, but which is all isolatable, so that you can turn appropriate taps. They gave up these a short out I don't know why, but uh, it, the font that I got, what we need to do. I was very anxious uh, to uh, get a, a new font, very anxious to get a new one, so the diocesan chancellor pointed out that as Chancellor of Salt, he just given uh, permission to take the font away from Highway Church, which had become redundant. And so by a piece of what the Chancellor of this pride of inspired Highway robbery, uh, we took the font from Highway and there it is. Very cleverly designed so that what was a before the font through the church has now on simple steps to come the right path to this. And the first page of that ties in it with Nicholas Thurlow, uh, uh, obviously called after the church. Uh, not an awful lot of ornamentation, but you see all the shields. If you all look the way I'm pointing, you see Yarmouth's original shield, very suitably, um, uh, uh, not as well, what's the green, blue, whatever you call it, you know, blue, anyhow, with three silver herring, showing how we owed our wealth to the herring. And then, as I told you, we lent, here, or gave King Edward III half his navy for the Battle of Slois in 1340, and so he in gratitude put the shield as you are pointing to it now. The next one, where we have the lions of England carved with the herring of young. Those who want to hear will keep near me because I know how shocking the acoustics are and you can't hear very far. The only person who's ever been heard all round the place without uh, technical aid was Bishop Basil Guy, who once preached to a cat church here through the whole thing, 3,500 seats. Anyhow, getting back to what you're looking at and I'm looking away from, uh, the organ was, of course, totally, completely and absolutely destroyed. How on earth were we to get a cathedral organ on a pittance of money? So uh, we searched England and we found St. Mary the Bolton's Kensington, which had a large three-manual organ going begging. We bought that for £5,000. Meanwhile, the Freemasons of Norfolk had been collecting money for many years for a peace thanksgiving memorial. They didn't know what to spend it on, uh, but uh, when they knew what I was doing here, they gave us £7,000 for this lovely organ case, a typical Dykespire organ case. I need say no more because there it is and you can see it and it's got the inscription uh, the church was absolutely packed with Freemasons one day in 1960, I suppose it was, when the then bishop, who was provincial grandmaster, handed it to me, and it was a most terrific thing altogether. Look, take a quick look this way at one of the world's widest side doors, and you see what a fantastic thing it is. They've even had to hide away the figures from the Christmas crib, uh, because uh, they were Oberammergau ones, 
uh, one of them, it doesn't matter which, let's say the donkey, was stolen about Christmas time some years after I left. And so all the others have been locked in the vestry ever since. And so the Lord Catholic, in the Lord Catholic, this week, the Lord Catholic, the Across the three central ones, 
uh, you see the symbols of our Lord's royalty laid aside, his crown and scepter right down at the bottom while he's crucified. Uh, the left you can see, I mean the, the one immediately to the left of the center is the flagellation. The one to the right is the way of sorrows and he's fallen beneath the weight of the cross. Down at the bottom you can see white tablecloths and stools, all the remains of the Last Supper. Uh, over to the left is our Lord in the garden, etc., etc. Over to the right is the resurrection. Down at the bottom you see Mary Magdalene in blue kneeling and our Lord is in white and uh, uh, he is dressing up at the top. Right at the top of the window is God represented as a fountain, the fountain of life. There on the high altar you see the splendid way Richard and his merry people have got it restored. You recollect it was uh, saved from the fire, stolen by some unknown devil, uh, found, uh, brought back here a short time ago and they resealed it and so on. Uh, the, uh, all the candlesticks, everything actually on the altars except the Victorian cross, they were all made by Howard Brown, the goldsmith of uh, uh, Norwich, designed by Dykes Bauer. He died of cancer about 15 years ago. Um, all along here, you can see trefoils, each with three balls. That, of course, is the three balls of St. Nicholas. They ought to be gilded, but money wouldn't run to it. The three balls of the pawnbroker, of course. Uh, and uh, they are very suitable. I remember it hadn't been open very long. I was standing just down there. A lady tripped over the step, or nearly did, looked daggers at me, and like John Betjeman, who starts a poem when things go wrong, it's rather taken to find we are ourselves to blame. We finally get it over quick and we go and blame it on the vicar. Looked daggers at me and said, I nearly fell over your step. Um, the uh, people uh, who had this very successful um, concern in Yarmouth for some years wanted to give some glory to the parish church uh, in memory of it, and so the head of, uh, and they uh, connected up with, as you mentioned, uh, with America as well. Um, uh, they all wanted to give something really, really posh and really grand and worthy of this church, and so they went all round it with me several times, and eventually we said, look. The one thing wrong with this great and glorious church is that it's too open. And despite the fact we've doubled the number of aisles up here, it still lacks a bit of mystery. Let's have some screens. And so we said to Dykes, uh, what about iron screens for a technological memorial? So Dykes Bar said, well, a few years ago, I designed some for the nave of Carlisle Cathedral which, as you know, is a very puny place because the Scotsman destroyed most of it years ago, I would like to do a much bigger and better version of Mark Carlyle's screens. Uh, let's put, uh, put uh, in, in like that. And so here are these screens. They were made by Eric Stevenson, super blacksmith of rocks. Mm. And there was a great sequel to that because the worshipful company of blacksmith thought we must make him a member of the Worshipful Company. And so he's the only member of the Worshipful Company of blacksmiths who's ever done any blacksmithing work. But of course, the, uh, the, you know, any of the companies, they do try and get somebody who's done something connected with their ancient status. And so Eric Stevenson has got that, and you probably saw it on the television, and didn't did you know you'd ever see the means by which he got it. It's magnificent work, partly wrought iron, partly cast iron. Um, the precise colours, Dykes Bower is hot stuff on colours, uh, and there it all is. The last of the uh, New Testament, no, the last of the Incarnation window was the Ascension, our Lord standing on the hill, and then up in the tracery of the angels receiving. And then the last of all of the New Testament windows here is the Holy Spirit in Acts, coming to inspire the disciples to go all over the world uh, spreading the gospel. Now that ties up very nicely with the fact that wanting to give this chapel a dedication and not knowing it's medieval dedication, we call it St. Andrew, so it all ties up very much with missionary intercession and missionary work, etc. It also ties up with the fact that not content with closing one redundant church, we pull down another redundant church, St. Andrew's, just over here, 
uh, and uh, instead of, so to speak, having the church's funeral, we had a marvelous marriage. On one particular occasion, the church wardens of St. Andrews and the choir and all the people came in a grand procession, uh, all those who could carry uh, objects belonging to the church, communion plate, registers and so on, brought them all in and put them here. Most marvelous example of the ancient parish church reabsorbing into its closer life uh, the life of a, a church that that year was a hundred years old, uh, the, the, uh, a daughter church. Now I think the vicar has very kindly put the plate out in the vestry for us to look at. I think that's true. Is that true? You know? You don't know any more than I do. Well, let's come to the vestry and see what we can find. I'm recording you. Oh, you go on recording me. Yeah. I'll tell you like. Well, those who have got in here first, shall I sort of get into a corner somewhere? Those who have got in here first uh, can uh, uh, rejoice with me and with Peter Newstead over here who tells me it wasn't the donkey that was stolen, it was a shepherd. And they've got uh, a real genuine, oh, Amigal Carver, to carve a real genuine new shepherd to take the place of the stolen one. So that's where modern devilry is confronted by modern Christianity. That's magnificent. Those who are in the direction I'm pointing can look at three photos. The top right hand is the Victorian church as it was. The bottom is the painting of the ruin as it was. And then the left hand is a painting of the central feature. Thank you, Peter, for holding up the ruin. That's what it looked like when I first got there. And you can see the Norman Tower. Now over here, I won't wander around, but I'll just point, and you can see what I'm pointing to. There was a very fine parish library begun about the Renaissance time, 1550, let us say, something like that, going on, being added to, borrowed from, books, I dare say, stolen and lost and destroyed. And you know, when the church was burnt, the vestry roof was the only one that wasn't burnt, but it was entirely incapable of keeping out rain uh, because of the shrapnel and so on. But the people of um, the, the, this place had <coughs> lost heart that they forgot these priceless books were here. They left them here suffering 13 winters and 13 lots of flood. And of course, when I got here, the first thing we did uh, was to get them out and we put them on the top floor of the then temporary library that had a floor, uh, 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 the top her floor had roofs, skylights and so on. And they laid every one open. The librarians turned the pages with great care daily for three years until we could put them back into the new church. And so they all dried out, all except three that were re quite irretrievable. Uh, they. There are lots of fascinating books there. You will notice the parish magazine that goes right back to the, we're almost the first parish to have a magazine at all. And, you're and the ones that are in red, look two shelves down in the centre of uh, my, uh, 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 my time here. I hope, Peter, wherever you are, where is he? There you are. I hope you're seeing to it that they're going on buying the parish <laughs> magazines, because if they let them come to an end, it would be a disaster. You ask the vicar, I'll ask him if I get the chance. <laughs> yeah, the box, they are. The yeah. box is the vicar here, pardon? Yes, they are. They are? Oh, hooray, hooray. Yes, right. Congratulations. Are they being put in there? Or? Yes, Oh, yes. congratulations. Oh, jolly good. That's fine. The box files contain all that was worth preserving of the correspondence. And in addition to trying to run this parish of 50,000 on six curates and a lay reader and etc., and five churches besides this one, I wrote with my own hand, because I had no doubt and no secretary in those days, wrote a, just about a letter a day, uh, total something like 400 a year for about four years to the architect and various others uh, uh, about various aspects of the work. Of which had to be personally. Well, oh, yes, 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 in Peterborough, the Treasury, and you remember Canon so and so uh, of the Treasury was uh, noticed that how big the flagons were, because uh, partly because they didn't receive the sacrament so often, partly because when they did receive it, they received, I would have thought, far more than reverence really dictated, and the flagons were very large. Well, all that tendency was uh, greater, more exemplified than anywhere else in this church. And here is its chalice. <laughs> that was its biggest one. Uh, I'm sure we know the date. I've forgotten it. But uh, uh, it's, uh, oh, what's all this? It says D-O-M-D-C, 
H-U-M-I, Humilimi, the very humble, this is for the greater glory of God, from the very humble L-M-C. Now, sir, if you know enough, Pat Yarmouth's know who L-M-C is, you know more than I do. Well, anyhow, the, 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 it's nice to think that, at any rate, his motive was to give this great chalice for the greater glory of God. So there it is. Lots of other, but that's the one word. Was the plate I, just at this juncture, I forget. Yes, uh, yes, it was. I, yes, I think it was. Oh, that's what it is. I get now. This is what it is. You've never believed this one. You've never seen it. It's true. Were you here? Well, he's not. He's not part of it. But when I got here, all the plate had been left in the safe ever since. If you couldn't believe such fantastic neglect, there it all was, locked up in this mother's safe, you see, which was uh, even damper than it is now. Uh, I had uh, the nearest, I think, the nearest time I came to a row with Dyke Star, and I somehow silly enough to let him get away with it, I said, you needn't think you can ever stop this being so damp. You'll have to do this, that, and the other. And he said he wouldn't, and he didn't. And so it goes on being damp as a memorial to Dyke Star's stupidity. <laughs> it could be, he was a bachelor, and he could be a very stupid man. Well, thank you so very much indeed for opening that. Now, before we leave, let me tell you a bit about this. Now, if I may tell you a bit about this. Um, I've told you that it was a monastic church, and it, of course, had a stone screen between the nave and the choir. Uh, just like Noster has, just like Ely has lost, uh, like Peterborough has lost, and like Norwich, as you'll see this afternoon, has got a stone screen. Here is the monastic stone screen. Who put it here? I do not know. Uh, I, my guess is probably it was about 1850, part of the Victorian Restoration, when they opened the whole thing out. And one of the open out people, uh, said that uh, we want to demolish the screen and open it out. And one of the few people who had a real interest in the history of the place said, well, open it out, but don't demolish it. Let's put it somewhere. So they probably put it here. So this is the ancient screen in that area. <coughs> and so uh, when we restored it, we thought we'd have posh cupboards to put posh things in, uh, or to give the screen a purpose. I've forgotten what's in these cupboards, and uh, uh, people were so worried. I know why people always worry about loos. If they forgot about them, they wouldn't worry. But here are the loos, uh, quite enough for everybody. We should have thought of that one before, uh, but there are some of the...